Starting the streaming. I don't know if it works. Starting the streaming. Kind of looks like that it works. But I don't know if the quality sucks. <laughs> well, there's audio anyway. I'm going to turn that off now. It is Wednesday. I think it is. I'm losing track of time. Wednesday, February 13th. Yes, tomorrow is the day of chocolates and delights. But for tonight is another day to stay inside, hide from the cold, and read as we continue on our British book month, I guess? It just became that for some reason because that's some of the books on my shelf, which I haven't gotten around to yet. And this one's not going to be a comic. It's not going to be a radio play. It's going to be a straight-up book book going to be Jeeves in the offing. Now, uh, I actually know very little about the Jeeves series or Jeeves and Wooster, which I think uh, was the name of it when it was on uh, like television stuff with uh, Hugh Laurie and uh, Steve Fry playing the titular character of Jeeves, a butler type person, and Hugh Laurie, who I suppose is just kind of like a well-to-do who just lives his days in a house i haven't watched downton abbey either so i don't know if that's a thing um uh, but we're gonna be reading from this and since again since it's just a book book um i'm not going to have a camera on the words because why bother and i'm also wondering stream quality wise if like live streaming the pictures of the book is what caused all the stuttering because i'm just watching the playback now and though the quality sucks because i lowered the uh bit rate uh the quality you know this doesn't seem to be stuttering so as long as you can hear me Hey, that's fine. Uh, if you're watching live too, you can always jump in the chat if you have a suggestion of for voices or things like that. Or if you're like, uh, I don't know, what I don't even know why else I'd have the chat open. Join along as we read and see how far one can get. Because I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, we see how far I can get in an hour. I'll try to enunciate things as well as I can. Uh, if you have your tea, of course, go get it going. I try to I try to theme my cups to the and this is like the. Uh, ritzy cup so we'll get a little sound for that i don't think you can hear that i can't even hear that okay well get yourself a nice cup of tea sit yourself in it's time for jeeves in the offing i'm not sure what an offing is either so it might be like jeeves isn't at all in this book this might be like a one-off where he doesn't even show up until the very end and it's uh yeah jeeves in the offing by P.G. Wod Wodehouse. Woodhouse. Woodhouse. Let's see how this goes. I apologize in advance for everything. <laughs> and I try, I'll try not to do too many British voices, because I know I'm probably going to mess it up somehow. I got people messaging me, too, about the Nintendo Direct. <laughs> Chapter 1. Jeeves placed the sizzling eggs and B, and it literally is a letter B with a dot after it, so I'm assuming that's bacon, on the breakfast table. Oh yeah, and we just confirmed Jeeves is very well in this book. Let's try reading without interrupting too much. <laughs> Jeeves placed the sizzling eggs and B on the breakfast table, and Reginald, Kipper, Herring, and I licked the lips, squared our elbows, and got down to it. A lifelong buddy of mine, this Herring, linked to me by what are called Im Imperishable memories. Impres is it imperishable? Imperishable. There you go. New words. It's not a new word. I know that. Years ago, when striplings, he and I had done a stretch together at Melvin House, Brimley on Sea. I don't know where that is. The pre preparatory school conducted by the Prince of Stinkers, Aubrey Upjohn, M.A., and had frequently stood side by side in the Upjohn study, awaiting the receipt of six of the judicious man, what's all these words? Juiciest, not judicials. Juiciest from the cane of the type of bithin like the serpent to the strength, like the adder. Now I'm going to get flustered if there's too many crazy British terms I've never heard. Let's see how long I can last. <laughs> So we were, you might say, rather like a couple of old sweets who had fought shoulder to shoulder on Crispin Day, if I've got a name right. The plate de jour having gone down the hatch accompanied by some fluid ounces of strengthening coffee, I was about to reach for the marmalade when I heard the telephone tooting, tootling, tootling out in the hall and rose to attend to it. Uh, I guess this is Jeeves' voice. No, wait, or the main character. I don't know who the main character is. He hasn't been introduced yet. I feel you had to be, like, deep into the series to know what's up at this point. Anyway. 
Uh, Berta Wooster resonance, I said, having connected with the instrument. Uh, Wooster in person at the end. Wooster in person at this end. Oh, that's what you said when you're on the phone. That's actually kind of cool. We should do that nowadays. You're just like, Wooster in person at this end. Oh, uh, hello. I added for the voice that boomed over the wire. That was of Mrs. Thompson of Port... All right, here we go. Port Tarlington, Travis, of Brinkley Court. Market Snoodbury, near Dartwich, or putting it another way, my good and deserving Aunt Dahlia. Now that was one page. I know you folks at home, you read your books, and you're like, oh, I read five books this weekend, and I don't know how you do it. Because that was one page. <laughs> Maybe you don't read them out loud. Maybe that's it. Gonna need some tea for this. What should her voice be, Miss Dahlia? <laughs> haughty pip-pip. A very haughty pip-pip to you, old ancestor. No, that's him. Damn it. I thought she was talking. I said, well pleased, for she's a woman with whom I had always privileged a chew the fat. Uh, that was a lot of words for one page, says Mitchell. Mi Michael. I can't even read names anymore. Michael. Michelle. One or the other. I don't know. <laughs> this is making me doubt everything. But we shall pursue. Uh... Okay, I think this is actually her. And a rousing toodaloo to you, you young bloat on the landscape, she replied cordially. I'm surprised to find you up this early at, at this. I guess at this hour. At this. Where have you just gotten from the night of, on the tiles? I hastened to rebuke this slur. Certainly not. Nothing of that description whatsoever. I've been upping with the lark this last week to keep Kipper Herring a company. He's staying with me till he can get into his new flat. You remember, the old kipper? I brought him down to Brinkley one summer. Chap with the cauliflower ear? I know who you mean. Looks like that Jack Dempsey. Lots of deep cuts in this. That's right. Far more indeed than Jack Dempsey does. He's on the staff of the Thursday Review, a periodical of which you may not uh, be a reader, and has a clock in the office at daybreak. No doubt when I apprise him of your call, he will send you his love, for I know he holds you in high esteem. The perfect hostess he often described you as. Well, it's nice to hear your voice again, old flesh and blood. How's everything down Market Snoodsbury way? Oh, we're jogging along, but I'm not speaking from Brinkley. I'm in London. Till when? Driving back this afternoon. I'll give you lunch. Sorry, can't manage it. I'm putting on the noose bag with Sir Ruderberg Glossops. Oh, man. These names are also just charming, but I have no idea how to read them all. This surprised me. The eminent brain specialist to whom she alluded was a man I would not have cared to lunch with myself, our relations having been on the stiff side since the night at Lady Wickham's place in Hertfordshire, when, acting on the advice of my hostess daughter, Roberta, I had punctured the hot water bottle with the draining needle in the small hours of the morning. Quite unintentional, of course. I had planned to puncture the HWB of his nephew, Tuppy Glossop, with whom I had feud on, and unknown to me, he had changed rooms. Just one of the unfortunate misunderstandings. Uh. Oh, okay, he's talking again. What on earth are you doing that for? Why shouldn't I? He's paying! I saw her point. A penny saved is a penny earned, and all that sort of thing, but I continued surprised. It amazed me that Aunt Dahlia, presumably a free agent, should have selected this very formidable loony doctor to chew the midday chop with. Oh, I like that. Chew the midday chop. I just like highlight pen statements that I enjoy. So then I can return and use it in kind. Chew, it's gone. Where'd it go? <laughs> chew the midday, I, this marker's dead. Okay, chew the midday chop. Well, that smudged the page. Continuing. Uh, however, one of the first lessons life teaches us is that aunts will be aunts, and I merely shrugged a couple of shoulders. Well, it's up to you, of course, but it seems a rash act. Did you come to London just to revel with Glossop? No, I'm here to collect my new butler and take him home with me. New butler? What's become of Seppings? He's gone. I clicked the tongue. Is that... I never knew what clicking the tongue meant when, like, reading them in books. I doubt it was the sound I made there. Might be like, tisk tisk. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I clicked the tongue. I was very fond of that major domo in question, having enjoyed many a port in his pantry, and this new saddened me. No, really? I said. Too bad. I thought he looked a little frail when I saw him last. Well, that's how it goes. All flesh is grass, I often say. I'm not highlighting that one. <laughs> uh... To, to Bognor Regis for his holiday. I unclenched my tongue. Unclicked my tongue. Oh, I see. That put a different complex uh, complexion on the matter. Odd how all these pillars of the home seem to be dashing away. <laughs> on toots these days. It's like what Jeeves was telling me about the great race movements in the Middle Ages. Jeeves starts his holiday this morning. Oh, Jeeves is going to be gone. So this is a book without Jeeves. Well, well, shoot. <laughs> or will it? Perhaps while he's in the offing, something will occur. Uh, Jeeves starts his holiday this morning. He's off to Harn Bay for the shrimping, and I feel like that bird of a poem he's lost his pet gazelle or whatever the animal was. I don't know what I'm going to do without him. I'll tell you what you're going to do. Have you a clean shirt? Several. And a toothbrush? Two. Both the finest quality. Then pack them. You're coming to Brinkley tomorrow. The gloom which always enveloped uh, Burtham Wooster like a fog when Jeeves is about to take his annual vacation lightened percep perceptibly. There are few things I find more agreeable than a sojourn at Aunt Delia's rural lair. S-O-J-O-U-R-N, sojourn. Hmm. Picturesque scenery, gravel, soil, main deranged... Main drainage <laughs> company's own water, and above all, the superb French chefings of our French chef, An Anatole, Anatole, God's gift to the gastric juices. <laughs> A full hand, you might put it. What an admirable suggestion, I said. You solve all of my problems and bring the blue bird out of a hat. Rely on me, you will observe me bowling up in the Wooster sports model tomorrow more afternoon, and my hair in a braid and a song on my lips. My presence will, I feel sure, stimulate Anatole, an Anatole to his heights of endeavor. Got anybody else staying for the old snake pit? Five inmates in all. Five? I resumed my tongue clicking. <coughs> Golly, Uncle Tom must be frothing at the mouth a bit. I said, for I knew the old buster's distaste for guests in the home. Even single weekender is sometimes enough to make him drain a bitter cup. Tom's not there. He's gone to Horgat with cream. You mean lumbago. I don't mean lumbago. I mean cream. Homer, Homer Cream, a big American tycoon who's visiting these shores. He suffers from ulcers and has a medicine man has ordered him to take to the waters of that place. Tom has gone with him to hold his hand and listen to him in the evening uh, while he tells him how filthy the stuff tastes. Antagonistic. What? I mean, altruistic. You're probably not familiar with the word, but it is one I've heard Jeeves use. It's what you say of a fellow who gives selfless service, not counting the cost. Selfless service, my foot. Tom's in the middle of a very important business deal with cream. If it goes through, he'll make packet-free an income tax. So he's sucking up to him like a Hollywood yes-man. I gave an intelligent nod, though this, of course, was wasted on her because she couldn't see me. I could readily understand my uncle by marriage's mental process. T. Portleton's Travers is a man who has accumulated the piece of eight in sackfuls, but he is always more than willing to shove a bit extra away behind the brick of a fireplace feeling, and rightly, that every little bit is added to what you've got to make to just a little bit more. <laughs> if you at home are following along... Tell me it makes sense. <laughs> and if there's one thing that's right up his street, it is not paying income tax. He grudges every penny the government nicks from him. Uh, okay, who, wait, oh. That is why, when kissing me goodbye, he urged me with tears in his eyes to lush Mrs. Cream and her son, Wiley, Willy, Wiley, Willy, whichever, up and treat them like royalty. So, they're at Brinkley dug into the woodwork. Wiley, did you say? Short for Wilbert. Okay, Willy, then. I mused. Willie Cream. The name seemed familiar somehow. I seem to have heard it on or seen it in the paper somewhere, but it eluded me. Uh, let me think. Okay, I'm assuming that... Adele Cream writes mystery stories. Are you a fan of hers? No? 
Well, start boring up on them directly when you arrive, because every little helps. I've brought the complete set. They're very good. I shall be delighted to run an eye over her material, I said, for I am what they call a something of novels of suspense. That was actually the words. I didn't cover that up. Aficionado, would it be, uh, would that be it? I can always do with another corpse or two. We have established, then, that among the inmates of this Mrs. Cream and her son Wilbert, there are other three? Well, there's Lady Wickham's daughter Roberta. I started violently, as if some unseen hand had goosed me. What, Bobby Wickham? Oh my gosh. Why? The agitation. <laughs> do you know her? Oh, you bet I know her. I bet you st I, I begin to see... Is she one of the gaggling of girls you've been engaged to? No, actually, no. Uh, we were never engaged, but that was merely because she wouldn't meet me halfway. Turned you down, did she? Yes, thank goodness. Why, thank goodness, she's a one-girl beauty chorus. She doesn't try the eyes, I agree. A pippin, if, I've ever, if ever there was one. Very true, but uh, is being a pippin everything? Uh, what price, the soul? Isn't her soul like mother's makes? I don't know what any of this means, but I'm delighted. Far from it. Uh, much below par. Why, I could tell you... But no. Let it go. Painful subject. I had been about mention... I had been about to mention 57 or so of the reasons why the prudent operator, if he valed his peace of mind, deemed it the best to stay away from the red-headed menace under advisement... I realized that at a moment when I wanted to get back to the marmalade, it would occupy too much time. It would be enough to say that I had long since come out of either and was fully cognizant of the fact that in declining to fall in with my suggestion that, uh, I feel like trying to read this, I'm sounding like CGP Grey from YouTube who kind of has this pace of things where he's like, the government will then find a system to have a election and the election where the queen will have herself a kingdom or something. I don't, I'm just making that up, but he kind of talks like that. He's very paced. And this is like my safe zone. <laughs> his, intel his intellectual talk this is my safe zone of narrative. I digressed again. Or is that... Uh... It will always be enough to say that I have long since come out of either and was fully cognizant of the fact that in declining to fall in with my suggestion that we start rounding up clergymen and bridesmaids, the basil had rendered me a signal service, and I'll tell you why. Aunt Delilah, describing this young blister of a one-girl beauty chorus, had called her shots perfectly correctly. Her outer crust was indeed of a nature to cause those beholding it to rock back on their heels with a startled whistle, but while equipped with eyes like twin stars, hair ruddier than a cherry, oomph, is, oh God, these words, esfigliari, it was even italicized, and all the fixings, B. Wickham had also the disposition and general outlook of life of a ticking bomb. In her society, you always had the uneasy feeling that something was likely to go off at any moment with a pop. You never knew what she was going to do next, or into the murky depths of soup uh, she would carelessly plunge you. Uh, okay, I think this is now Jeeves talking. Do I do Stephen Fry? or do I do, uh, Miss, Miss Wickham, sir, Jeeves had once said to me warningly at the time when the, fewer, uh, the fever was at height. Lacks seriousness. She is volatile and frivolous. I would always hesitate to recommend as a life partner a young lady with quite such a vivid shade of red hair. Man, why is Jeeves hating on people all of a sudden? I thought Jeeves was like this this middle ground. I don't, I don't even know. I don't know what the thing of the time was. His judgment was sound. I have already mentioned how, with her subtle wiles, this girl had induced me to sneak into Sir Roddick's Glossop's sleeping apartment and apply the darning needle to his hot water bottle. Oh, she's a prankster. I see. And that was comparatively mild going for her. In a word, Roberta, daughter of the late Sir Cuthbert and Lady Wickham of Skedlings Hall, Hertz, was pure dynamite and better kept at a distance by all those who aimed at leading a peaceful life. The prospect of being immured with her in the same house, with all the fac uh, facilities a country house afforded, as an enterprising girl <laughs> for landing her nearest and dearest to the multi get town way in some other words, made me singularly dubious that her shape of things to come. And I was tottering around the blow when the old relative administrated another, and it was Haymaker. 
And there's Aubrey Upjohn and his stepdaughter Phyllis Mills, she said. That's the lot. What's the matter with you? Got asthma? I took her to be alluding to the sharp gasp which had escaped my lips, and I might confess that uh, it had came out not unlike the last words of a dying duck. But I felt perfectly justified in gasping. A weaker man would have howled like a banshee. There floated into my mind something Kipper Herring had once told me. Uh, Kipper Herring. Who's Kipper Herring? <laughs> you know, Bertie, uh, he said in a philosophical mood, we have much to be thankful for in this life of ours, you and I. However rough the going, there is one sustaining thought to which we can hold. The storm clouds may lower and the horizon grow dark. We may get a nail in our shoe and be caught in the rain without an umbrella. We may come down to breakfast and find that someone else has taken the brown egg. But at least we have the consolation of knowing that we shall never see Aubrey God help us up John again. Always remember this in time of despondency, he said, and I always had. And now here the bounder was bobbing up right in the, my mists, enough to make the stoutest hearted go into his dying duck routine. Mm. Aubrey Upchon, like quavered. It's not quivered, it's quavered. You mean my Aubrey Upjohn? That's the one. Soon after you made your escape from his chain gang, he married Jane Mills. A friend of mine with a uh, colossal amount of money. She died leaving a daughter. I'm the daughter's godmother. Up John's retired now and going in for politics. The hot tip is that the boys in the back room are going to run him as the conservative candidate in the market snowed's buried, driven by the next dex by election. Lots of interplay in politics in this book. What a thrill it'll be for you meeting him again. Or does the prospect scare you? Certainly not. We Woosters are intrepid. Uh, but what on earth did you invite him to Brinkley for? I didn't. I only wanted Phyllis, but he came along too. You should have bunged him out. I hadn't the heart to. Weak. Very weak. Besides, I needed him in my business. He's going to present the prize for the Market Snoodsbury Grammar School. We've been caught short, as usual, and somebody has got to make a speech on ideals and the great wide world and those blasted boys, so he's fit in nicely. Excuse me, as I... Itchy nose. <laughs> Back at it. I believe he's a very fine speaker. His only trouble is that he's stymied unless he uh, he has his speech with him and can read it. Calls it referring to his notes. Phyllis told me that. She types the stuff for him. I thoroughly low, a thoroughly low trick, I said severely. Even I, who have never soared above the yeoman's wedding song at the village concert, wouldn't have the crust to face my public unless I'd taken the trouble to memorize it, the words. Though actually, with the yeoman's wedding song, it is possible to get it quite comfortably by keeping singing ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, I hurry along in short. I would have... I don't know the reference, sorry. I would have spoken further, but at this point, after urging me to put a sock in it, I have given and given me kindly enough of a warning not to step on any banana skins, she rang off. Wow, that was chapter one. What's uh, the, what's, the, what's the time? What's the damage? What did that put me at? Oh, only twenty-four minutes. Only twenty-four minutes to read one chapter of a book. How do you guys do at home? You at home player? Uh, reading at home? Players at home? I'm trying to think of an old game show term. Are you like a one chapter an hour type person? I guess depending on the book. Chapter two. I came away from the telephone. Why is my nose so itchy? Ugh. It's seasonal allergies, I tell you. I came away from the telephone on what particularly amounted to lead leaden feet. Here was feeling. Here was feeling. The cold's got to my brain. Here, I was feeling, was a nice bit of box fruit. Bobby Wickham, with her tendency to stir things up, and with each new day to discover some new way of staggering civilization, would by herself have bad, been bad enough. Add Aubrey up, John, and the mixture becomes too rich. I don't know if Kipper, when I rejoined him, noticed that my brow was sickled. Wait, was Kipper the dude who was in the room with him at breakfast? Oh, God. 
Okay, I'll have to remember these things. I imagine when people do official book on tapes, they've like read it once before and figured all this out. <laughs> they'll just jump in the booth like me with a cup of tea. And exactly, blah, 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 blah. Something about Jeeves. Where are we? And Aubrey. Okay, Kipper, when I rejoined him, noticed that my brow was sicklied, sicklied over to the pale cast of thought, and I had heard Jeeves put it. Probably not, for he was tucked into a toast and a marmalade at that moment. But it was. <laughs> As had happened so often in the past, I was conscious of an impending doom. Exactly what form this would take, I was, un of course, unable to say. It might be one thing or it might be another, but a voice seemed to whisper to me that somehow, at the some not distant date, Bertram was slated to get in the gizzard. That was Aunt Dahlia, Kipper, I said. Oh, was this the guy who I... I just want to double check if this was the guy who I had the deep grumbly voice for. Uh, and even if not, maybe I'll just do it anyway. Screw it. We're all going in for this. <laughs> Bless her jolly old heart, he responded. He's, this guy's probably like his age, too. One of the very best, and you can quote me on saying so. I shall never forget those happy days at Brinkley. We shall be glad at any time that suits her to kind catch another invitation. Is she up in London? Till this afternoon. We fill her to the brim with rich foods, of course. No, she's got a lunch date. Uh, she's browsing with Sir Roderick Glossop, the loony doctor. You know him, don't you? Only from hearing you speak of him. A tough egg, I gather. One of the toughest. He was the chap, wasn't he, who found the 24 cats in your bedroom? 23, I corrected. I like to get things right. They were not my cats. They had been deposited there by my cousin Claude and... Uh, Ostas. Os, Ostas. But I find them difficult to explain. But I, find, well, I found them difficult to explain. He's a rather bad listener. I hope I shan't find him at Brinkley, too. Are you going to Brinkley? Tomorrow afternoon. You'll enjoy that. We shall I? <laughs> well, shall I? The point is a very moot one. You're crazy. Think of Anatole. Ana I, I got it. A N A T O L E. I think that's the French chef, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Anatole. Unless it's like a silent A. Those dinners of his. Is the name of the Perry who stood dissonant at the gate of Eden familiar to you? I heard Jeeves mention her. Well, then, how I feel. Well, that's how I feel. <laughs> when I remember Anatole's dinners. When I reflect on every night his dishing them up. And I'm not there. I come within a very little of breaking down. What gives you the idea that you won't enjoy yourself? Brinkley courts an earthly paradise. In many respects, yes, but life there at the moment has its drawbacks. There's far too much of that uh, where every pros pr prospect pleasant and only man in vile stuff buzzing around for my taste. Who do you think is staying at the old Doss house? Aubrey Upjohn? Aubrey Upjohn. Oh, that's a rhetorical question. To him. It was plain that I had shaken him. His eyes widened and an astonished piece of toast fell from his grasp. Old Upjohn, you're kidding. No, he's there. Himself, not a pitcher. Himself, not a pitcher. And it seems only yesterday that you were boying me for bo bo boying, boying me up to telling me I'd never have seen him again. The storm clouds may lower, you said, if you recollect, but how does he come to be at Brinkley? Precisely what I asked the age relative. And she had an explanation that seems to cover all the facts. Apparently, after we took our eye off him, he married our friend of hers, a friend of hers, one Jane Mills, and acquired a stepdaughter, Phyllis Mills, whose godmother, Aunt Delia, is. The ancestor invited the Mills girl to the Brinkley, and up John came along for the ride. I see. I don't understand. I don't wonder you're. I don't wonder you're trembling like a leaf. Not like a leaf exactly. Yes, I think you might describe me as trembling. One remembers that fishy eye of his, and that wide bare upper lip. It won't be pleasant having to gaze at those across the dinner table. Still, you'll like Phyllis. Do you know her? We met out in Switzerland last Christmas. Slap her on the back, will you, and give her my regards. Nice girl, though goofy. She never told me she was related to Upjohn. She would naturally keep a thing like that dark. Yes, well, one sees that. Just as one would have tried to keep it dark, if only... Uh, if one could have been mixed up with any way with Palmer, the poisoner. 
what gas of garbage was that was he used to fling at us when we were serving our sentences at Melvern House. Remember that sausage on Sunday? And that boiled mutton? The caper sauce? And the margarine. Recalling that last, it's going to be a strain having to sit and watch him getting outside pounds of best country butter. Oh, Jeeves. I said as he shimmered in to clear the table. You never want to preparatory... You never went to a preparatory school on the south coast of England, did you? No, sir. I was privately educated. Ah, then you wouldn't understand. Mr. Herring and I were discussing our former prep school bake, Aubrey Upjohn, M.A. By the way, Kipper, Aunt Delilah, was telling me some things about him, and I never knew before of which ought to expose him to the odium of thinking men. You remember those powerful end-of-term addresses he used to make us... make to us? Well... He couldn't have made them if he hadn't had a stuff of typed out on his grasp. Oh, he's criticizing his reading of speeches. Man, everyone's really cutting deep in, the, in those days. Without his notes, uh, as he called them, he spent f- he, he's a spent force, revolting that Jeeves, don't you think? Many orators are, I believe, similarly handicapped, sir. Too tolerant, Jeeves, far too tolerant. You must guard against the lax outlook. However, the reason I mention up John to you is that he has come back into my life, or will be so coming into the next two ticks. He's staying at Brinkley, and I shall be going there tomorrow. That was Aunt Delia on the phone just now. And she's demanding my presence. Will you pack a few necessities, uh, necessaries, in the suitcase or so? Very good, sir. When you're leaving on your Herney Bay jaunt, I was thinking of taking the train this morning, sir. But if you would prefer, I would remain till tomorrow. No, no, perfectly all right. Start as soon as you like. What's the joke? I asked at the doctor closing... Wait. I asked as the doctor... As the door... I could do this. I believe in myself. I asked as the door closed behind him, for I observed the kipper was chuckling softly. Not an easy thing to do, of course, when your mouth's full of toast and marmalade, but he was doing it. I was thinking of up, John, he said. I was amazed... It seemed incredible to me that anyone who had done time at Malvern House, Brimley on the Sea, could chuckle softly or otherwise when letting out a mid-dwell on the outstanding menace. It was like laughing lightly while contemplating one of those horrors from outer space, uh, <laughs> which are so much with us at the moment of the motion picture screen. I envy you, Bertie. Wait, I envy you, Bertie. He went on, continuing to chuckle. You have a wonderful treat in store. You're going to be present at the breakfast table when Up John opens his copy of this week's Thursday Review and starts to skim through the pages devoted to comments on current literature. You should explain that among the books that recently arrived in the office was a slim volume from his pen dealing with the preparatory school and giving him, probably preparatory school, and giving him the enthusiastic build-up. The formative years which we spent there, he said, were the happiest of our life. God zooks! He little knew that his brainchild would give, would be given to one of the old lags at the Melvern House to review. I'll tell you something, Bertie, that every young man ought to know. Never be a stinker, because if you are, though you may flourish for a time like a green bay tree, sooner or later retribution will overtake you. I need scarcely tell you that I ripped the stuffing out from the beastly little brochure. The thought of those sausages on Sunday filled me with this righteous fury of juvenile. Of who? Nobody you know. Before your time. I seemed to... Uh, I seemed inspired. I seemed in- inspired. Yeah, that's what I said. Normally, I suppose, a book like that would get me a line and a half in the other recent publication column, but I gave it 600 words of impassioned prose. How extraordinary for fortunate for you to be in the position to watch his face as he reads them. How do you know he'll read them? He's a subscriber. <laughs> there was a letter for him, from him in uh, one of the correspondence pages a week or two ago, in which he specifically stated that he had been one for years. Did you sign the thing? No. Ye Ed is not keen on underlings advertising their names. And he was really hot stuff. And it was really hot stuff? Red hot. So I am closely at the breakfast table. Mark his reaction. I confidently expect the blush of shame and remorse to mantle his cheek. <laughs> the only catch is that I don't come down to breakfast when I'm at Brinkley. Still, I suppose I could make a special effort. Do so. You will find it worth your while, said Kipper, and shortly afterwards popped off to resume the ear earning of the weekly envelope. 
He had been gone about twenty minutes when Jeeves came in, bowler hat in hand, to say goodbye. A solemn moment, taxing our self-control to the utmost. However, we both kept the upper lip stiff, and after he had uh, kidded back and forth for a while, he started the withdrawal. He started to withdraw. Uh -huh. He had reached the door when it suddenly occurred to me that he might have an inside information about this Wilbur Cream of whom Aunt Dahlia had spoken. I have generally found it that he knows everything about everyone. Oh, Jeeves, I said. Half a jiffy. Sir? Something I want to ask you. It seems that among my fellow guests at Brinkley will be a Miss Homer Cream, wife of the American Big Butter and Eggman, and her son Wilbert, commonly known as Willie. Uh, and the name Willie Cream seems somehow to touch a chord. Rightly or wrongly, I associate it with the trips we have taken to New York, but in what connection I haven't the vaguest. Doesn't ring a bell to you? Why, yes, sir. Referencing to the gentlemen are frequent in the tabloid newspapers of New York, notably in the column conducted by Mr. Walter Winchell. He is generally alluded to under the uh, subric of Broadway Willie. Of course, it all came back to me. He's what they call a playboy. Precisely, sir. Notorious for his escapades. Yes, I've got, I've got him placed now. He's the fellow who likes to let off stink bombs in nightclubs, which rather falls under the head of carrying coals in Newcastle, and seldom cashes a check at his bank without producing a gat by saying, This is a stick-up! And no, sir, I regret that he has for the moment escaped my memory. What has? Something other little something, sir, and that was and that I was told regarding Mr. Cream. Should I recall it, I will communicate it with you. Yes, do. One wants the complete picture. Oh, gosh. Sir? Nothing, Jeeves. Just a thought had floated into my mind. All right. Push off. Yeah, you uh, are your Mr. Train. Good luck on your shrimping net. Whew. Page 22. I'm still in the game. <laughs> I'll tell you what I thought, uh, what the thought was that had floated. I have already indicated my qualms at the prospect of being cooped up in the same house with Bobby Wickham and Aubrey Upjohn, for whom I could tell the harvest might be. <laughs> if in addition to these two heavies, I was also in cheek, in check, in cheek, yeah, well, I was right the first time, by, in cheek by jowl, with a New York playboy apparently uh, afflicted with the bats in the belfry. Belfry. I don't know. <laughs> it began to look as if this visit would prove too much for Bertham's frail strength, and for an instant, I toyed with the idea of sending a telegram to regret the an oiling out. Then I remembered Anatoly's cooking, and was strong again. No one who had once tasted them would wantingly despise himself from the wizard's smoking offerings. Whatever spiritual... <laughs> Agonies I might be about to undergo at Brinkley Court, Market Snoozebury, near Dorwich, res uh, residence there, would at least put me several supremes de frogois au champagne and marguanette de poulet perder duch ahead of the game. Nevertheless, it would be uh, <laughs> paltering to the truth to say that it was I at my ease and stuff and words and phrases and things and books that are being read. I could do this. I could do this. That's why we drink the tea. Okay, nevertheless, it would be paltering with the truth to say that I was at my ease as I thought of what lay before me in darkness, Worcestershire, and hand and lit after the breakfast, Gasper shook quite a bit. At this moment of nervous tension, the telephone suddenly gave tongue again, causing me to skip like the high hills as if the last trump of had sounded. I went to the instrument, all of a twitter. <laughs> Some species of butler appeared to be on the other end. Scrat, more butler voices. Mr. Wooster. On the spot. Good morning, sir. Her ladyship wishes to speak to you. Lady Wickham, sir. Here is Mrs. Mr. Wickham, m'lady. Oh, Mr. Wooster. Okay, he's Mr. Wooster, because he's Jeeves of Wooster. Of oh, Wooster, I tells you. And Bobby's mother came to the air. I should have mentioned, by the way, that during the above exchange of ideas with the butler, I had been aware of a distant sound of sobbing, like background music, and it now became apparent that it was from uh, the lar 
larynx, larynx of the relic of the late Sir Cuthbert that it was preceding. There was a short intermission before she got the vocal cords working, and while I was waiting for her to start the dialogue, I found myself wrestling with two problems that presented themselves. The first, what on earth is this woman ringing me up for? The second, having got the number, why does she sob? It was problem A that puzzled me particularly, for ever since that hot water bottle episode, my relation with this parent of Bobby's had been on the strain side. It was indeed an open secret that my standing with her was particularly that of a rat of the underworld. I had had this from Bobby, uh, who in, in whose impersonation of her mother discussing me with sympathetic crones had been exceptionally vivid, and I must confess that I was altogether surprised. No hostess, I mean to say, exceeding her hospitality to a friend of her daughter's, likes to have the young visitor going about the place puncturing people's water bottles and leaving the three in the morning without stopping to say goodbye. Yes, I could see her side of things all right, and I found it extraordinary that she should be seeking me out on the telephone in this fashion. Feeling as she did, so allergic to Burton, I wouldn't have thought that she would phone me with a ten-foot pole. However, there beyond the question, she was. Mr. Wooster? Oh, hello, Lady Wickham. Are you there? I put her straight up at this point, and she took time out of to sob again. She then spoke in a hoarse, throaty voice, like Tallulah Bankhurd after swallowing a fishbone the wrong way. Is this awful news true? Wait, who, oh, no, it's her. Is this awful news true? Eh? Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. I don't quite follow. In the morning's times... I'm pretty shrewd, and it seemed to me, reading between the lines, that there must have been something in the issue of The Times published that morning that for some reason had upset her, though why she would have chosen me to tell her troubles to was a mystery not easy to fathom. I was about to institute inquiries in the hope of spearing a solution, when, in addition to sobbing, she started laughing in a hyena-esque manner, making it clear to my trained ear that she was having hysterics, and before I could speak there was a dull thud suggestive of some solid body falling to earth. I knew not where and when the dialogue was resumed, I found that the butler had put himself on as an understudy. Hey, Mr. Wooster? Still here? I regret to say that her ladyship has fainted. It was she I heard going bump? Precisely, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Goodbye. He replaced the receiver and went about his domestic duties, there is no doubt, including the loosening of the uh, stricken woman's corset and burning feathers around her nose, leaving me to chew on the situation without further bulletins from the front. It seemed to me that the thing to do here was to get hold of the times and see what it had to offer in the way of enlightenment. It's a paper I don't often look at, preferring for breakfast readings the mirror and the mail, but Jeeves takes it in, and I have occasionally borrowed his copy, with a view of having a shot at the crossword puzzle. It struck me as a possibility that he might have left today's issue in the kitchen, and so, I pro and so it proved. I came back with it, lowered myself into a chair, lit another cigarette, and proceeded to cast my eye on its contents. At a curious glance, what, may, what might have been called swoon material appeared to be totally absent from its columns. The Duchess of something had been opening a bazaar at Wimbledon, at Wim, Wim, Wimbledon in aid of a deserving charity. There was an article of salmon fishing on the Y, on the right, on the way, the Y, some water place. <laughs> and a cabinet minister had made a speech about con conditions. Ugh. All these dashed words in between sentences. But I could see nothing of these items to induce a loss of uh, consciousness. Nor did it seem possible that a woman would have passed out cold on reading that Herbert Robinson, 26, of Grove Road, Pondered End, had been judged for stealing a pair of green and yellow check trousers. I turned to the cricket news. Had some friend of hers failed to score in someone's in, in one of yesterday's country matches owing to a doubtful LBW decision? It was just after I had run my eye down the births and marriages that I happened to look at the engagements, and a moment later I was shooting out of my chair as if a spike had come through its cushion seat and penetrated the fleshy parts. Jeeves! I yelled and then remembered that he had long since gone with the wind. 
a better thought, for if ever there was an occasion where his advice and counsel was of the essence, this occasion was that occasion. The best I could do, tickling it solo, tackling it solo, <laughs> was utter a, howl, a hollow G and bury the face and hand. I wonder if that means like growl or something. And though it seems to hear my public tut tutting in disapproval of such neurotic behavior, I think it, the verdict of history will be that the paragraph of which my gaze had rested was more than enough to excuse a spot of face burying. It ran as followed. Forthcoming marriages. The engagement is announced between Burton Wilberforce, Wooster of Berkeley Mansion, W.I., and Roberta, daughter of the late Sir Cuthbert Wickham and Lady Wickham's of Skettleton Hall. Hurts. <laughs> Foul play is afoot. A false betrothal doth be posted in the Times. And that ends chapter two. Whew. Mm. Oh, you know what? I'm going to look this way. This is just like in the cover. He's reading the Times and he found the news. And what a time for Jeeves to be in the offing. Chapter 3. This will probably be our last chapter as we're approaching the hour. And I also have uh, tickets to go see Alita Battle Angel tonight. <laughs> well, as I was saying, I had several times when under the influence of her oomph taken up with Roberta Wickham the idea of such a merger. But, and here to the point, I would stress... I could have sworn that on each occasion she had declined to cooperate and that in a manner which left no room for doubt regarding her views. I mean to say, when a girl offered a good man's heart laughs like a when a girl offered a good man's heart laughs like a bursting paper bag and tells him not to be a silly ass, the good man is entitled to think, to assume that uh, the whole thing is off. In the light of this announcement in the Times, I could only suppose that w on one of those occasions, unnoticed by me, possibly because my attention had wandered, she must have dropped her eyes and came through with a murmured, Right-o. <laughs> Right-o. <laughs> Though then this could have happened, I hadn't the foggiest. It was, accordingly, as you will readily imagine, a Burton Wooster with dark circles under his eyes and a brain th threatening to come apart at the seams who break the sports model on the following afternoon in the front door of Brinkley Court, a Burton, in a word, who was asking himself what the dickens all this was about. Nonplussed with or simple sums it up. Nonplussed, more or less, sums it up. It seemed to me that my first move must be to get a hold of my fiancé and see if she had anything to contribute in the way of clarifying this situation. Interesting. As in generally the case at country houses on a fine day, there seemed to be nobody around. In due season, the gang would assemble for tea on the lawn, but at the moment I could spot no friendly native to tell me where I might find Bobby. I proceeded, therefore, to roam hither and thither about the grounds, and massage in massages and massages in the hopes of locating her, wishing that I had a couple of bloodhounds to aid me in this task for the traversal uh, for the, for the Travers, Demzen, Demzen, in a spacious one, and there was a considerable amount of sunshine above, though none I needed scarcely mentioning in my heart. Apologize and post uh, all the words I can't read right. <laughs> this is draining my brain. But hey, it's good practice, right? When's the last time you all read out loud? Anything. Instruction manuals. And I was tooling along a moshy path with a brow a bit wet with honest sweat when there came to my ears the unmistakable sound of somebody reading poetry to someone. And the next moment I found myself confronting a mixed twosome who had dropped anchor beneath a shady tree in what is known as a leafy glade. They had scarcely swum into the keen, swum into my keen, when the welkin started ringing like a bilio, this was due to the barking of a small dash hound, or doction, I guess, depending, who now advanced on me with the apparent intention of seeing the color of my insides. Uh, milder 
cons- consul- councils, however, prevailed, and on arriving at journey's end, he merely rose like a rocket and licked me on the chin, seeming to convey the impression that in a Bertram Wooster he had found what the doctor ordered. I have noticed before in dogs this tendency to form a beautiful friendship immediately on getting within sniffing distance of me. Something to do, no doubt, with the characteristic Wooster smell, uh, which for some reason seems to speak to their deeps. It tickled him behind, I tickled him behind the right ear and scratched the base of his spine for a moment or two. Then the civilities concluded, switched my attention to the poetry group. It was the male half of the sketch that had been doing the reading, a willowy bird of about the tonnage and general aspect of David Niven with ginger hair and a small mustache. Ah, I need some more tea. Ten minutes left. Let's see if we can crush this chapter. How many pages? Jeeves, speed round. Oh gosh, I gotta read like ten pages in ten minutes. Can it be done? <laughs> mm, where was I? Mill half, something about a mustache. A wily bird of the tonnage, general aspect. And David Niven and ginger hair and a small mustache. As he was unquestionably not Aubrey Upjohn, I assumed that this to be Wiley Cream, or Willie, Willie Cream, and it surprised me a bit to find him dishing out verses. One would have expected a New York playboy, widely publicized as uh, one of the lads, to confine himself to prose, the dirty prose at that, but no doubt these playboys have their softer moments. His companion was a well-stacked young featherweight who could uh, who could be none other than Phyllis Mills, of whom Kipper had spoken. Nice but goofy, Kipper had said, at the glance told me that he was right. One learns, as one goes through life, to spot goofiness in the other sex with an unearing eye, and his exhibit and this exhibit had a sort of mild, soul's awakening kind of expression which made it abundantly clear that, while not a super goof, like some of the female goofs I'd met, she was quite goofy enough to be going on with. Her whole aspect was that of a girl who, at the drop of a hat, would start talking baby talk. This she now proceeded to do, asking me if I didn't think that Poppet, the dash hound, was the sweetest little doggy. I assaunted rather austerely, austerly, for I prefer the shorter form more generally used, and she said she surprised, supposed I was Miss Travers's nephew, Bertie Wooster. Oh yeah, his nickname was Bertie. Which, for as we knew, was substantially the case. I heard you were expected today. I'm Phyllis Mills. Oh, I'm giving her that voice. That's like my default, <laughs> she said. And I knew I had divined as much that Kipper had told me to slap her on the back and give her his best. And she said, oh, Reggie Herring? He's a sweetie pie, isn't he? I agreed that Kipper was one of the sweetie pies and not the worst of them. And she said, yes, he's a lambkin. Don't know what that is. Okay, how's our time? We're still doing this. Oh, shoot. 853. We're falling behind. This dialogue had, of course, left Wilbert Cream with a bit of, out of it. Uh, just pointed, uh, just painted on the backdrop, as you might say, and for some moments knitted his brow, plucking at his mustache, shuffling the feet, and allowing the limbs to twitch. He had been giving abundant evidence that, that in his opinion, three was a crowd, and that what the leafy glade needed... Uh, to make it, all that was a leafy glade should be a complete absence of Woosters. Taking advantage of a lull in the conversation, he said, Are you looking for someone? I replied that I was looking for Bobby Wickham. I'd go on looking if I were you. Bound to find her somewhere. Because he's American, I'm going to lean into a Texan accent, because why not? <laughs> Bobby, said Phyllis Mills, she's down at the lake fishing. Then what do you do, said... Wait, uh, uh, uh. Then what do you do, said Wilbur Cream, brightening, is follow this path, bend right, shape left, bend right again, and there you are. You can't miss. Start at once is my advice. I must say I felt that, related as I was to ties of blood, in the manner of speaking, to this leafy glade, it was a bit thick being a practically bound, <laughs> bounced from it by a mere visitor, but Aunt Dahlia had made it clear that the Cream family must not be thwarted or put upon in any way, so I did as he suggested, picking up the feet without anything in the nature of back chat. As I receded, I could hear in the rear the poetry breaking out again. 
The lake at Brinkley calls itself the lake, but when all the returns are in, it's really more sort of a young pond. Big enough to mess about in a punt, though, if, uh, and for the use of those wishing to punt a boathouse, have been provided with a smaller pier or landing stage attached to it. On this, rod in hand, Bobby was seated, and it was me, and it was with me to work in an instance to race up and breathe down the back of her neck. Hey, I said. Uh, gosh, I don't have a voice for her. Oh, did the streaming stop? Did the streaming freeze? Did the streaming crash? It's all, like, jittery. Well, if my voice is still going, that's a plus. Video output low. Not receiving enough video to remain... You'll experience buffering. I don't know what's going on. I think my internet sucks. Oh, no. YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. I don't even know what that means. Sorry, folks. Let's do an internet speed test. Internet speed test. This will probably make things worse. This will probably make things worse. This will probably make things worse. Okay, so my download is fine. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. What if I up some numbers? <laughs> Let's do 1800. Let's see if that changes anything. If you guys can still hear my voice, I apologize. It's I've I've been having a terrible bout of interneting these days. Uh, well, I'm being told that the stream is stuttering and stopping. So if you can hear my voice this has been jeeves and wooster jeeves and the offing oh good my upload speed is 0.24 oh uh, jeez maybe streaming just isn't for me under this internet package Thanks, tech savvy. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we should call it that then. And I'll just fill the frame with this book. <laughs>